Eurotrash was a late night comedy show popular in the UK during the 90s. It showcased offbeat topics from in and around Central Europe. The subjects ranged from wacky musical acts, absurd art, and very often sex. A regular guest on the show was a 30-something blonde called Lolo Ferrari. She had found recent fame entering the Guinness Book of World Records as the woman with the largest breast implants. She would appear regularly on the show up until her death in 2000, at the age of 37. As details of her life and death became public, it was clear that there was more to her story. It would be one of dysmorphia, exploitation, and suspected murder. My friends, it's me again, Lolo Ferrari. Lolo Ferrari was a model, singer, actress, stripper, and adult film star. But before that, she was Yves Valois, born in 1963 in clermont ferrand in France. In interviews, she often spoke of an unhappy childhood, with a distant father and a mother who would often criticise her appearance. In her teens, she took up modelling, taking on jobs wherever she could, and at 17, she met the man who would become her husband, manager, and pimp, Eric Veen, 39-year-old ex-con who instantly saw potential in Eve. They married within a year. Eve had never been happy with her appearance, and in 1988, after a photographer criticised the shape of her nose, she would undergo what would be the first of many surgical procedures. The shape of her nose was decided by Veen, who would go on to meticulously project manage her subsequent surgeries, drawing up sketches of how he wanted her to look. Eve would undergo a further 21 operations, all devised and overseen by Veen, and by age 33, her breasts had grown from a 37D to a 54J. Eric Veen had completely redesigned her, and her gigantic breasts would earn herself a place in the Guinness Book of World Records. Each weighing six pounds, containing three liters of saline solution, and purportedly designed by an engineer in the aeronautics industry. Her new implants would garner some attention, but it would be short-lived. Over the next few years, Eve would scrape a living, modeling, stripping, and eventually, encouraged by Veen, performing in hardcore pornography, where she would adopt the stage name of Lolo Ferrari. Money was tight, and Veen put Eve to work as a prostitute. He was later found guilty of pimping and handed a six-month suspended sentence. In 1995, in an attempt to drum up publicity, Veen devised a plan to attend the Cannes Film Festival. With the world's press in attendance, Eve revealed her breasts to the crowd. The publicity stunt stole the show, and the name Lolo Ferrari would become a name known around the world. A string of film appearances followed, along with the launch of her music career. Her first single was a Eurobeat number called Airbag Generation. She was booked to perform the song on the show Eurotrash, where she would cause such a sensation that she would become a regular guest. Eve was outspoken about how she hated her time as a sex worker, and it would seem that those days were behind her. The flat, clinical lighting of the porn set had been replaced with the reassuringly warm glow of the TV studio. She seemed entirely in her element on screen, but behind the scenes things weren't nearly as cheerful as her on-screen presence might suggest. She had become highly dependent on a cocktail of pills for anxiety, pain, and depression. Her implants caused severe back pain and interfered with her breathing. She had become estranged from her family, and in a chilling letter to her mother, she would write, It was not me who wanted to be like this. He is forcing me, and I'm scared. Eric Veen was the mastermind behind Eve's transformation and career. He's an ever-present figure in the archives of her life. Rumours of abuse and infidelity were prevalent, and Eve's mother hated him. In interviews, she described him as androgynous, and even speculated that he was somehow living out his own fantasies of transformation vicariously through Eve. 
The 2004 documentary, Death of a Porn Star, suggests he based the designs for Eve's surgeries on Coxinelle, a famous drag artist who happened to be a friend. It's hard to say for certain what drove Veen in his obsessive redesign of his wife, but money is a solid bet. Veen's own lawyer would later describe Eve as the goose that laid Veen's golden eggs. By 1998, Eve's fame would begin to fade. With TV networks no longer interested, Veen organised club appearances which he dubbed Lolo Nights, where leering crowds could grope her. In a last ditch effort at rejuvenating Eve's music career, Veen launched the Silicon Girls, a pop trio fronted by Eve and featuring sisters, who Veen had convinced to undergo similar surgeries. The project was unsuccessful, and their first and only single would eerily be called Set Me Free. It would seem that, for the general public, the novelty of Lolo Ferrari had worn off. By 2000, tensions had become high between the couple. Despite living together, Veen had stopped talking to Eve. She was no longer profitable. In a distraught letter to her mother, Eve describes living in constant fear and claimed that Veen was forcing her to take drugs. She signed off the letter with, I would like to die. In March of 2000, she retreated to bed early and she would never wake up. Veen found her body the following morning. An autopsy revealed that she had consumed a fatal dose of antidepressants and tranquilizers. Eve's death had been ruled a suicide, but her mother was suspicious. On her insistence, nearly two years after Eve's death, a second autopsy was conducted. The results would show evidence for auto-mechanical asphyxiation, a possible indication that she was smothered with a pillow. The evidence was enough that Veen was arrested for the murder of Eve Valois. In what was a brief whirlwind of fame, Eve was treated as a novelty. She was teased and laughed at on talk shows, and groped and ogled at on stage. Even when her death was announced, lurid rumours spread that her implants had exploded during a flight. In interviews, she insisted that she was happy with the changes that she had made to her body, and that the thought of being skin and bone terrified her. Psychologists speculate that she suffered from body dysmorphic disorder, a preoccupation with an imagined defect in one's physical appearance. She desperately wanted to change who she was, and in vain, she found someone who was all too willing to take charge. <laughs> 